Hello and welcome to Indian Standard Time. I'm Siddharth Vardarajan and my guest today is Devi Fortuna Anwar, Indonesian scholar and a former advisor to the Indonesian Vice President. Uh, Dr. Anwar, it's a great pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very much for having me here. It's rare uh, for us to uh, have an opportunity to interview uh, somebody from Indonesia on this channel. Uh, countries, India and Indonesia have enjoyed a long historical relationship. In the 20th century, extremely close political uh, uh, relationship. And uh, today, as India increasingly uh, regards itself as uh, a country where the maritime dimension of its security is increasing in salience, this adds a new uh, uh, level or a new layer of, of commonality between India and Indonesia. So I want to start uh, by uh, drawing you out, first of all, on Indonesia's outlook and orientation uh, as far as the sec wider security issues in the Asia-Pacific or what's increasingly called the Indo-Pacific region uh, is concerned. We know that uh, this region is one where big powers uh, are active, big power rivalry already exists and is expected to sharpen or get accentuated. It's one of the st most strategic sea lanes passes through, through Indonesia, which is the Strait of Malaccas. Uh, Indonesia, uh, before we started, you said may not be a maritime power in the, in the strict sense of the term, but it's a, it's a maritime nation and the maritime dimension of its security is perhaps the most important one. How does Indonesia view the prospects for increasing geopolitical uh, rivalry, big power rivalry in the maritime zone that you, uh, you occupy? And what hopes does Indonesia have that uh, any differences of opinion, any rivalry can be peacefully sorted out? Yeah. Well, uh, Siddharth, uh, firstly, uh, I'm here as a guest of the ICCR, uh, Indian Con Council for Cultural Relations. Uh, and as you're right, you know, there's, despite the uh, long cultural historical relations between India and Indonesia, we seem to have mostly ignored each other uh, in the past decades. And it is only in recent years that we are rediscovering uh, each other. Yes. And, and as far as Southeast Asia is concerned, we are always living in a very dangerous environment because there are many great powers uh, around us. Uh, there's always been the United States across the Pacific, there's always China, there's Japan, there's Russia to the north. Uh, and India uh, to the west, uh, although India, India has not been very much a factor uh, in the geopolitical rivalry uh, within the region. So as far as Indonesia is concerned, in the past our focus has been very much uh, to, the, to the northern uh, 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 area because that's where the competition, particularly in the South China Sea. Right. So we have always been very, very concerned uh, about that, that area. Uh, even at, at the end of the Cold War, when other parts of the world talk about the peace dividends, uh, that was never the case, you know, uh, for, for East Asia. Uh, in fact, uh, immediately after the, uh, the, the, the Cold War ended, uh, the military budget for every country went up uh, because, you know, it was like rediscovering the 20th century yes. uh, again. Uh, exactly. So, so uh, the competition between, between the great powers is, oh, is an ever-present uh, reality. So, for the most part, uh, Indonesia and uh, the ASEAN countries have tried Firstly, within the Southeast Asian region itself, we have tried to work very hard to ensure our strategic autonomy by creating a, a regional code of conduct. As you know, we have a, a treaty of amity and uh, uh, cooperation of Southeast yes. Asia where violence should not be used to settle disputes. Right. And also where we try to insulate the region from uh, immediate uh, interventions from great powers. And then as ASEAN becomes stronger, it has become much more ambitious as well. As well. It has tried uh, to manage relations with the major powers. Uh, uh, Through the regional you know, forums uh, and so, 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 yeah. so we might call it, you know, de developing uh, a more inclusive regional architecture. Mm. Uh, the East Asia Summit, for example, uh, is uh, the latest and the, 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 high, uh, the highest level. Mm. And, and uh, the East Asia Summit was uh, created in 2005 when Indonesia actually signed the strategic partnership with India at the time. Um, and that was aimed to bring the, all the major powers to the same table. In the beginning, there was uh, only plan that the East Asia Summit would, would comprise of the 10 ASEAN countries plus the three Northeast Asian countries, China, Japan, and South Korea. It was Indonesia in particular, and also Singapore, uh, that said, you know, this is not sufficient. 
because uh, it will not be possible for ASEAN and Japan simply mm. to balance China. Mm. So uh, we decided that you know it is very important to bring in India, India. In, 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 into the in, into the forum as well, and then Australia and New yeah. Zealand. And by 2012, we have also brought in the United States and Russia. So this inclusive architecture uh, is something that we have really uh, tried to aim at, and we focus on cooperative security. So trying to develop. Uh, confidence, confidence building measures, right. preventive diplomacy and so right. on. But um, uh, under the new presidency, President Joko Widodo, there is a new emphasis on Indonesia's maritime identity. You're right, Indonesia has always been a Nusantara. It has always been an archipelagic uh, uh, country. Yes. Uh, and we, uh, under the UNCLOS uh, 1982, the you know, uh, UN Convention on the Law of the Seas, we are recognized as an archipelagic state. But in reality, our control of our maritime domain has always been limited. Throughout uh, most of the new order government of President Suharto, the focus was very much on control of land and people. Mm. You know, it was, it was a non-democratic mm. government. It was very mm. concerned uh, on ensuring political stability. And, and the security. strategic environment was also very different. Uh, back and the in strategic those days, in, yeah. environment, uh, the multipolarity yeah. was there, but it's, but, uh, you know, it was still, you know, uh, not an easy uh, reality. Uh, but China was still rising, uh, uh, still working on its peaceful rise. Right. Uh, it was, and, and uh, ASEAN countries were trying to engage China to bring it in into the regional order. Uh, but it wasn't really seen as a new military threat. Yeah. In the past, it was an ideological threat to Southeast Asia because of its communism. But uh, it wasn't really seen as a, a present naval uh, uh, threat, for example. Uh, but uh, late, uh, you know, in the past, we have not really been focused that much on our maritime domain because of limited resources. You know, the building a navy is very mm. expensive. Uh, and it's only lately that as in Indonesia has uh, become uh, much more developed. Uh, we are becoming more democratic. Our military can no longer be engaged in domestic politics. So they also need to focus their attention to mm. external defense, you know, to becoming a professional military so mm. that we begin to pay much more attention to our external defense rather than internal security. Right. Uh, and at the same time, the environment becomes much more challenging, yeah. uh, especially you know, with, with the rise of China and, uh, and uh, the uncertainty of the American role in the region. Mm. And then you have um, uh, new transnational challenges at sea, uh, both in terms of you know, like piracy, mm. smug uh, human uh, smuggling, and, and, and uh, environmental uh, challenges, and so on. So uh, and, and illegal fishing is becoming a major issue. Mm. Uh, Indonesia has lost a lot of its uh, wealth uh, through, uh, you know, this illegal and unregulated and undocumented fishing. Mm. So that the new government of President Joko Widodo has, in fact, focused very much also on bu building Indonesian mm. uh, maritime mm. uh, uh, development, security, and, and so on. And at the same time, because we are in the middle, you know, mm. we are uh, uh, at the crossroad between the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. Uh, there is this new concept of making Indonesia into a, a global maritime fulcrum. Right. Uh, in the past, as you know, our attention is to say Malacca, the South China Sea. Mm. And now uh, we, have, we have tended to ignore the Indian Ocean. Mm. So now there is this desire you know, to, to also pay equal attention to right. the Indian Ocean. Right. Now, President Jacobi is one of those mm. regional leaders who, despite the uh, rise of China, uh, and despite China, let, let, me, let me put it this way, uh, despite China mo moving away from the peaceful rise phase into a slightly more assertive, uh, uh, you know, stance, uh, President Jokowi has been one of those regional leaders that has tried to maintain uh, even relations with Beijing. Uh, he's not seen as uh, a China beta. Yet, uh, on the Natuna Islands issue, he took a pretty strong stand. What's happening there? I mean, where does Indonesia see uh, its own bilateral issues with China uh, going? Well, we have very good relations with China. Like uh, in 2005, Indonesia signed strategic re uh, partnership with India and with China in, in, in the same year. And the, uh, at the diplomatic level, mm. I never thought, never thought that I would live to see Indonesia giving free visas to Chinese visitors. Yeah. Uh, because in the past, <coughs> there was very uh, strong suspicions, for example, of, of uh, visitors coming from China. Uh, China is now one of our biggest investors. Uh, as China is investing in major infrastructure uh, projects, including building bridges, you know, uh, power plants, uh, railways, uh, and also in, in terms of uh, defense cooperation. Mm. Uh, we all have very close relations with China. Uh, China is a major market also for our products. So I think that this is probably uh, one of the, the best times 
uh, in terms of bilateral relations with China. But at the same time, we have issues mm. also. Uh, we never recognize this nine dash line yes. uh, in the Natuna. Indonesia's position has always been that under UNCLOS, you know, there's no such thing as that, that nine dash lines. And uh, when uh, Chinese uh, fishermen entered Indonesian uh, exclusive economic zones, the uh, Indonesian mm. uh, 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 Navy uh, or, or Coast Guard, you right. know, tried to chase them away. Right. And so there was that uh, incident mm. when the uh, Chinese Coast Guard tried to rescue uh, the, the illegal fishing boat from the Chinese side. Uh, and, 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 you know, had a, a near skirmish yes. with, the, uh, with Indonesian uh, uh, naval authorities. Yes. So, uh, President Joko Widodo uh, made it very clear that this was unacceptable. Uh, in Indonesia is, uh, has a very strong stance about uh, illegal fishing. Mm. We do not see that as a sovereignty issue. We see it more as a law and order uh, issue, law, mm. a more a law enforcement issue. We said that we do not have any sovereignty disputes with China. Uh, because, as I said, you know, uh, that EEZ is very clearly under yeah. UNCLOS, it belongs And you don't accept the historical, the historical line claim of the Chinese? No, yeah, and yeah. Uh, that in, in terms of when China said, you know, there's traditional fishing rights, yeah. uh, and under UNCLOS, you have to negotiate bilaterally for that. Yes. And, and we, Indonesia doesn't have that agreement yeah. with China. So, uh, you're right that uh, President Joko Widodo, in fact, uh, organized a cabinet meeting on a warship uh, near the, uh, you know, in the waters of Natuna. Yeah. So, so we can be very good friends with China yes. on one hand, but, but on also certain firm, issues. Firm firm on, on, issues on, of firm on uh, exactly. certain other issues. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, the Philippines uh, took China to uh, the uh, uh, Law of the Sea Tribunal and the Arbitral Tribunal gave a ruling which was not in China's favor. Yes. Uh, do you think that international law and mm. the instrumentalities of UNCLOS and the mm. uh, Hamburg Tribunal and the Arbitral Tribunal can serve as a as a Mm. as a forum for the resolution of these issues or is it largely political strategic and requires mm. at the bilateral and eventually perhaps even multilateral level ASEAN and China sitting together to say mm. we have to sort this out? Well, the international ruling serves as this important benchmark yeah. of who owns what and what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. But I don't think anybody has actually solved uh, uh, bilateral territorial disputes th through that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that court. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, uh, except of, except yeah. if they go yeah. voluntarily, yeah. for so example. Ex yeah. Except, yeah. You know, except yeah. when, uh, when countries go there voluntarily, yeah. but you, we, we use ICJ instead, International Court of Justice. Yeah. For example, Indonesia and, and, and Malaysia, uh, to resolve its dispute over the Sipadan, Ligitan Island, uh, agreed mm. uh, to, to uh, because we do not want this issue to stand on our relations. They say, you know, leave it the International Court of Justice. Uh, for the South China Sea issues, in terms of uh, preventing conflict, then we can do it bilaterally. Mm. Bilaterally, that's mm. what ASEAN is pushing for a, 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 a bi more binding code of conduct. Mm. So to, to to ensure that disputes do not op uh, become an open conflict, you know, yeah. you can uh, use a multilateral forum like ASEAN, ASEAN Regional Forum, mm. and, and so on and so forth. Mm. But when it comes to settling the disputes themselves, it has to be done bilaterally. Through bilaterally. And frankly, I do not, I cannot imagine within the foreseeable future that any of those disputes can be resolved. China will continue to claim the entirety of the South yeah. China Sea and the other claimants will continue. Yeah. Uh, and China uh, believes know. its hand is getting strengthened yeah. uh, as each passing yeah, year, it, uh, with each passing year. Yeah, uh, but uh, I, don't, um, I cannot imagine the Philippines, the, 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 the Vietnamese, the Malaysians yes. or the Bruneian would, would yeah. give up their exactly. own claims. Exactly. So the most that we can do at the moment is uh, to manage the conflict, right. to the potential, potential to conflict. To ensure that there's no untoward mm. incident. Yeah, exactly. and, and then also in fact, uh, as you know, Potential conflict is also a, an opportunity for cooperation. Mm. So uh, that's why a lot of activities mm. take place in the South China Sea rather mm. than Indian, Indian Ocean. Mm. Because Indian Ocean, maybe there are not that too many overlapping right. claims. Right. Um, uh, there was some talk initially of uh, mm. joint patrols in which Indonesia would, uh, in, in Indonesian Navy would join hands with Australia, for example, Japan. That didn't happen finally, is it? Because mm. the Indonesian side is wary of what the signaling uh, what impact this might have on Beijing, and that you feel it would be a kind of escalation that would not be helpful, or is it well, just that well, these things haven't happened yet? Well, I know that the president mentioned this, but as far as the matter, even with among ASEAN countries, we do not have joint patrol. We only have coordinated patrol. Hmm. For example, in the Straits of Malacca, we have coordinated patrol. The Indonesian Navy yeah. would patrol on its side. The Malaysian Navy would patrol on its as side. A, as an anti-piracy thing. Yeah, 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 and yeah, yeah. So we actually we haven't done any joint patrol with any other countries. Right. And with Australia in the south, yeah. it may be a bit a bit difficult. Yeah. Right. But uh, but I, I suppose you know that when the president mentioned that it is an expression of concerns. Uh, you know, of, yes. of, of maybe of, of the possible tensions in the, in, in, in the South China Sea. Mm. Exactly. Mm. Um, uh, the U.S. is the other country that 
uh, whose whose behavior or activity in the recent past is a, is a source of, of uh, uncertainty if not instability it's not just china yeah. uh, since the election of donald trump we mm. really don't know what shape what final shape us policy towards the asia pacific and towards the indo pacific region will take we do know that uh, he has uh, essentially gutted the trans pacific partnership uh, tpp which was being negotiated and which president jokovi at some point wanted indonesia to also be a part of how concerned are uh, analysts like you in jakarta about uh us policy towards asia uh, you know we've seen in the last week for example the us saying that diplomacy has run out in north korea which if taken to its logical conclusion can mean quite a frightening uh policy turn so how concerned are you that uh, us policy towards asia is going to become very very unpredictable well we are very concerned with the united states being unpredictable you know that that is one thing that we are always very nervous about and as you know with the americans uh we always have this ambivalent uh, attitude towards the united states Indonesia like India is a non-aligned country yes. you know so we are not uh, a military ally with the United States but we have very close cooperation in fact uh, Indonesia has uh, and the United States have also signed a strategic a comprehensive strategic uh, partnership mm. so it has lift, uh, lifted up uh, its bilateral relations to a higher level uh, our concern as you know is uh, if the US ignores the region mm. then there is always this fear that it could be seen as there is a va- va- power vacuum that other Uh, uh, power could try uh, to fill yes uh, so the the south east asia welcomed the in, uh, the us pivot uh, when when china started to become much more assertive uh, so there is concern you know is it the end of the us pivot because if mm. that were the case then there is this fear that uh, uh, it would embolden mm. uh, 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 china mm. uh, to become much more adventurous mm. uh, 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 you know uh, but the indications in the, are that yeah. he may double down yeah. on the but, pivot but, actually but, yeah. yeah but on the other hand you uh. see if china, if the united states becomes too assertive uh, you know trying uh, uh, in, in ensuring its freedom of navigation yeah. and and are not working on diplomacy that is even more worrying yes. because uh, the last thing we want is to have a hot conflict in yes. our neighborhood because it would be very very unpredictable yeah. so here this is clearly uh, a job for us you know yeah. for indonesia and india too which is a member of the east asia summit right. uh, 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 because uh, india is also on the table you know right. to convince both the united states and right. china you know to always put diplomacy as right. a premium right. because it is better to talk 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 right. uh, uh, exactly. to exhaustion uh, exactly. uh, rather than to be trigger happy exactly. yeah. uh, dr number if i can shift a gear slightly to mm. uh, another area of commonality between india and indonesia which is the moderate nature of islam in both yeah. countries yeah. uh and there is a perception mm. uh, among some analysts that the growing influence of the kind of saudi mindset or the saudi yeah. saudi inspired radicalization mm. may be overrunning uh, uh indonesia may be overrunning indonesian islam how concerned uh mm. are you as an analyst how concerned is the mm. uh, jokowi government uh, at this kind of prospect mm. that uh, mm. uh somehow the uh moderate nature of indonesian islam may be getting subverted we seen for example these protests mm. against the uh, jakarta governor you know who's a christian chinese christian minority mm. uh, and there's a blasphemy case and i think there have even been calls that uh, uh, voters who vote for him will not be mm. uh, given a, a burial in mosques and so on so how how much uh, is this an area of concern for you as an analyst well uh, clearly there are concerns because we have our shares of radicalism and and uh, violent extremism we have our the bali bombing you know uh, yeah. uh, that was uh, the local branch of al qaeda then we have a series of terrorist attacks you know in jakarta uh, and we have people joining isis and there was concerns about the the freedom uh, that the foreign for terrorist fighters would be returning but given the fact that indonesia has 250 million people uh, the uh, the numbers of indonesians joining isis actually much less than pe- uh, people from uk uh, joining joining isis or many, many other uh, european countries joining that uh, Yes there is rising conservatism uh, salafism and wahhabism but i'm quite confident to say that in the whole indonesia remains basically moderate mm. we pride ourselves in saying that indonesia is a country where islam modernity uh, and 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 democracy walk hand in hand and as mm. well now we had you know with women empowerment mm. and now in fact indonesia uh, precisely because of the conflict in the middle east where sometimes religion has been mi- misused for violent activities uh, Indonesia is not trying to present itself as a new center for Islamic thought mm. uh, where you know we can uh, become a new uh, uh, center of Islamic civilization in which 
uh, peace, tolerance, moderation, uh, you know, could be displayed openly. Mm. So Indonesia continues to pride itself in that. Uh, I think we we'll, should look at the Jakarta election as Jakarta specific. Okay. Jakarta election gains a lot of attention because it is a national capital. Uh, when, you know, Ahok as a governor, uh, as an incumbent governor is in trouble because of his uh, mistake in pronouncing some, some, some uh, comment about the Quran, which was taken by some of the more conservative groups as being blasphemous. Yeah? Uh, this should not be seen as countrywide. Okay. Uh, there are many, many provinces in Indonesia where, in fact, Islamic parties support non-Muslim candidates and, and they have never been an, an, an issue. Right. So I would argue that this is in Jakarta because the, in, the running, uh, those who are running for the uh, uh, governors mm. are all backed by major parties with major national figures. Uh, the, the political contestations uh, is much more heated. Right. Uh, and I expect that after the uh, gubernatorial election, regardless of who wins, mm. uh, it would tone down again. Okay, that this issue would not have any wider resonance or wider traction, either in Jakarta right. or the rest of the I, country. I don't think so, matter. because as I say, you know, in other parts of right. the country, there right. are uh, uh, Christian governors who are, you know, who yes. are supported by, by Islamic, right. Islamic uh, yes. parties. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned uh, the, the mm -hmm. fact that you have some Indonesian nationals who are part of ISIS in Syria. Of course, the numbers are less than European uh, mm. uh, fighters mm. who have gone there. Nevertheless, uh, there is the prospect that you will have to deal with of some of these people coming back. Yes. Uh, the prospect that you will face then is either having some kind of a, an excellent de-radicalization program or being able to monitor their movements. Uh, is this a challenge? Is this something that worries uh, Indonesian intelligence services, the mm -hmm. law enforcement agencies that you have uh, these young men uh, who uh, are perhaps in, already in touch with people back home? Uh, how? Uh, uh, seriously, is the government uh, being able to, you know, monitor this and uh, take steps to ensure that it doesn't become a wider problem? Yeah, we are we are taking this uh, very seriously. You know, after the Bali bombing, uh, Indonesia established a new uh, uh, what is it called counter terrorism uh, agency, mm -hmm. uh, and it we have tried to do both the soft approach and the hard approach. The hard approach is you know due process of law. We don't have any secret prisons. You know, we don't torture them. But due process of law, and some of them, of course, you know, if they fight back, uh, they have been dealt with severely. But the stronger emphasis is on the soft approach, because if we only have the hard approach, and then you ignore their reintegration into society and you ignore their family, then they tend to be radicalized again. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, it has to be a whole package. Right. And I, I must say that the de-radicalization, uh, you have to work much harder in the prevention. Uh, because our young people sometimes are becoming self-radicalized mm. through, through the internet. And so the government is also now trying to pay more attention to what are being published in the mm. internet. Mm. And of course, like in any other democratic countries, there's now a fierce debate about mm. to what extent should you allow the government to intervene with, uh, to monitor internet and shut down uh, radical yes. websites. Yeah. How, would this intervene with civil rights, right. with freedom of uh, information and right. so on? So this is an ongoing debate, but the government is paying uh, greater attention to that. Right. And for the returning, uh, we have, in fact, uh, many families, so not just young men, you know, uh, men and women and, and, and their children uh, going, uh, trying to go to Syria. And some have been arrested in Turkey and be returned home. They have to go through a process. Mm. So, uh, yeah, we are, you know, the government is taking serious attention. And is there any data that. on uh, when people say growing Salafi influence that, that of, of, of more money coming in or mm. number of Salafi influence madarsas increasing? Is this something that is tracked and monitored by the government or mm. is it essentially just a media, media hype? Uh, both. Yeah. It, it, the country being that big, sometimes the government loses touch yes. with some of them, including yeah. with some of the uh, uh, released prisoners. Mm. Uh, Recently, there was a, a, a small terrorist attack uh, against a, 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 a police, uh, a policeman, um, and it turned out that this was a newly released prisoner. Okay. Uh, so that meant that the government, that right. the police has lost track right. of, of him. You know, so right. recidivism uh, right. still still occurs. Right. So uh, I think that we could, we, they could do much better right. uh, in that in that respect. Right. Uh, on that note, uh, Devi Fortune and where we'll have to leave it there. We're completely out of time. It's been a real pleasure having you on the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that wraps up this episode of Indian Standard Time. Do join me again next week when we will have another guest for you. Thank you for watching.